So today we're going to continue on is it God or is it man? Two parts to this message. I want to review on part one. A few weeks ago we did part one. Some weren't with us. So I want to do a short review, but just to introduce us, we're following up on a couple of messages from Pastor Noel where he talked about the importance of being on the plan of God and not on our own plan. And so we need to know the plan of God. We need to be able to discern when we're on his plan and when we're on some other plan. Amen? So I followed up to that with this message on is it God or is it man to help us to distinguish between God's plan and our plan or the plans of God and the plans of men and so I first looked at six biblical examples of where people got it wrong and I'm just going to touch on those today not deal with them in any detail numbers the 16th chapter uh, and we read a few verses beginning at verse 1 verse, verses 1 through 3 remember that Korah the, the so called Korah rebellion Korah and some others rose up against Moses and Aaron and said you take too much on yourselves you have exalted yourselves into place of leadership and what they missed was no they didn't exalt themselves it wasn't a human exaltation it was God that had moved them into that position set them in that position so they were seeing it as something that they had done themselves, that they had exalted themselves when really God had done the exalting. Then we went to Judges, the 14th chapter, and the first few verses where Samson tells his parents that he's seen a woman in the land of the Philistines. He wants her as a wife, and they respond and say, well, why couldn't you get a wife from our people? Why'd you have to go to the Philistines? Philistines and uh, he's, he kind of brushed him off and said no but I, I, I need to do this and uh, then it tells us I think it's in the fourth verse that actually this was a God plan and they didn't know it because he wanted he was setting up the Philistines to uh, be attacked by Samson and this was one of the tools that he was going to use. In the 45th chapter of Genesis, we talked about Joseph, how he ended up in Egypt through some uh, uh, activity of his brothers that seemed to be ungodly at the time. But later in that 45th chapter, he tells, uh, he tells them after they're in Egypt and being saved from terrible famine because he's there, and has a place of authority that hey you thought that you did this that this was a human thing that man created this situation but really God sent me here to preserve life and so they thought that it was just something they had done as humans but really it was a God plan then we shifted to three examples where they got it wrong in the other direction in the 21st chapter of Judges is this in 20th and 21st chapters of Judges is this description of the Israelite fight with the tribe of Benjamin and as a result of this fight which is really over the rape of a concubine which took place and the Israelites wanted the Benjaminites to send the guilty parties out they refused and so there was a battle about it and in that battle many Benjaminites died and then later they blamed the whole thing on God said that God had taken Benjamin the tribe of Benjamin out of the camp of the people of God when really it was the people that had done the whole thing they had done it because they through their refusal to deliver the guilty parties had brought battle 
military action on themselves and then it was the military action done by the humans that took the tribe away then in the book of Ruth we pointed out that Naomi thought that she had been abandoned by God that God had afflicted her and of course she lost her husband and two sons but that wasn't God punishing her it was really caused I believe by their own actions the actions of these men she was caught up in the result or the consequence but later we see that God is blessing her through her daughter-in-law and the Bible says that she became more uh, valuable to her more love shown to her through this daughter-in-law than seven sons could have provided and then we see in the book of Deuteronomy in the first chapter we cited as another example where they thought God was doing something that was really a human cause the Israelites wanted to go up and fight the Canaanites and they thought God was with them they thought it was God's plan we're following God's orders we're gonna take these people because God is with us man he's gonna power us to do this thing but Moses told them you guys are mistaken God is not in this he was before when you refused to go but now he's not here's a lesson in that too because sometimes there it's something that there was a time when this would have been the plan of God but we're not in that time amen there's a little less a little side lesson in that amen sometimes there's a change in circumstances or even just in God's thinking or plans or intentions so that the timing is kind of important here as well but anyway they went up on their own authority and action and got routed amen and they came back weeping and confused and that happens to us sometimes when we mistake events ideas decisions we think that it's God and it's really man or the other way around it's important for us to know both of those we to, to, to avoid both of those mistakes amen because sometimes there are plans of men or ideas that come to us as humans and we think they're just ideas that we thought up or somebody else thought up and really they're something that God is sending to us and if we take it as a man thing we can kind of say well I can do that or I can not do that or we don't take it that seriously but if it's if it's really from God we want to know it because we don't want to miss what God is asking of us amen so so I then wanted to share these five ways or tips suggestions however you want to frame them from the word about how to distinguish is it God or is it man and I think I gave you two already for this service but is because we always have people who aren't with us I'm going to repeat the first two briefly and then we'll spend a little time on three four and five are you with me yes. hallelujah I know it's warm in here but we do have a little bit of air conditioning going it's not as bad as it could be thank God for that amen so the number one thing I shared in terms of these five keys to knowing is it God or is it man really getting on the plan of God not on the human plan was to 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 notice if there's something supernatural about the circumstances because if if there is then that is gonna be a God plan in the in the case of Moses where the people were saying you exalt yourselves they should have known better because he was perform constantly performing miracles 
how could he do that unless God was with him and had anointed him to be that leader? They couldn't do a fraction of what he was doing in their own strength, and that yet they're saying, you just exalted yourself. Joseph was a man who had miracles all throughout his life. He went into a uh, service with a military leader and was became captain of that house, leader of that house, next to the, the master, had all kinds of freedom and authority. And then he had a gift, supernatural from God, to interpret dreams. And that was key to him getting to where God wanted him to be. Amen? And doing what God wanted him to do. So there was, the fact that he could interpret those dreams was supernatural. It was a miraculous thing. So look in your life for the miracles that tell you, wait a minute, God is working here. I shared with you an exa a couple examples, I think, last time. I won't go back to that now. But you can get the uh, part one tape if you want to hear that from my life where I knew it was God because the circumstances were miraculous. The second thing I shared was from the book of Kings, 1 Kings, and, uh, from Pat, some, some verses from the 12th and the 22nd chapter, uh, chapters of 1 Kings. And the message there was, the learning there was, that God shows us if it's him or not, through counsel sometimes. But it has to be godly counsel. Amen? And so we looked at those two passages, and between the two of them, they showed where God was able to give godly counsel to avert a terrible, catastrophic war between different factions of God's people because Rehoboam was going, to, was going to force a joining of the two kingdoms the Israel the northern Israel and Judah by force and remember that he he came to that because he made a mistake before that in listening to the counsel of the young elders instead of the older elders. Because they were ready to, to say, we'll come in under you. Just, just load, lighten our load a little bit. And he, he came back with that response from the younger leaders which said, you, you, you're, you, you, you think Solomon is rough. You haven't seen nothing yet. And they said, We'll see you. So then he decided, I'll force this thing. And then a prophet, Jehoshaphat, was wise enough to say, let's inquire of the Lord before we do this. How many know that it's very important if you're going to inquire of some man or woman of God that God has put in your life to help you stay on course do it before the decision. Amen? Sometimes folks have come to me afterwards. This is what I did. And already they're seeing the trouble. And the most you can do then is damage control. Amen? Now, I've had other situations where they came and maybe were thinking about and maybe had even made some steps in a certain direction I'm thinking of a particular case right now. Happened just a few months ago. Called me, told me what they were thinking about doing. And I said, I immediately saw it was disaster. And I said, please don't do that. And I gave some counsel, which was heated, and it avoided terrible mistakes. But you have to get to the counselor before you're committed. Amen? God in his mercy will sometimes soften the blow even when we do. 
make mistakes. Amen? Have you ever done it? I have. Thanks, thankful for a merciful God, a forgiving God. Then we showed in 1 Kings 22 the uh, importance of getting the right counsel. Amen. And uh, you have to be careful that you're really going to a true prophet of God. Remember that scenario where they were t talking about going to battle against the Syrians, the Israelite king and the Judean king were going to come together and do it. And they sought to get counsel in this Israelite king Ahab brought these 400 phony prophets to the table. He said, oh yeah, we're in. Go up and rout them. And then Jehoshaphat said, do you have any real prophets here that we could talk to? <laughs> and when he got, and, and they got the, the true word then, but they didn't heed it. Amen? Disaster. So, making sure the timing is right, making sure that the counselor is right. But so many times we don't use the counsel of the leaders of God to put in our life and, and it leads to trouble. So now I want to take us to uh, number three. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. And a lot of you know this already and are using it, but for those that aren't, it's so powerful. It, and I want to give you two scriptures to pray. And this is to get the ongoing leading of God about what He's asking for. Amen? How many want that to be just an ongoing staple of your existence? So, so Paul has given us these two prayers. They're wonderful prayers. And actually, there's a third uh, that we're not going to look at in the third chapter of Ephesians. But in the first chapter of Ephesians, starting in the 15th verse, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. So you see that he's praying for them. And here's what he's praying. Number one, that the God of the, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. That's what we need, isn't it? We need wisdom and we need revelation everybody say revelation. revelation we need revelation in the knowledge of God we need to know what God is thinking so Pastor Cynthia and I have been praying this prayer for months almost every day the whole prayer but this this part is so relevant for right now that we want revelation of the knowledge of God. And we can pray for that. Just like Paul prayed for them to get it, we can pray for us to get it. We can pray that individually. Amen? So that's, that's one. And then in the book of Colossians is the other one that I would give you, and it's it, it's in the uh, ninth verse of the first chapter that we can pray for ongoing leading, knowing insight into what God is wanting, is thinking, is planning. Verse 9, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray. So you see, once again, he's praying different church congregation but he's praying for them that what that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will 
See, that's what we need, isn't it? We need to be filled with the knowledge of the will of God with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I want that, don't you? You say, how do you get it? We can pray for ourselves to have this. Amen. And I believe in praying it continually. I don't, you don't have to pray it every day, but I think it's good for us all to have this as a regular part of our prayer life. God, I want to know your will more because we want to get on God's plan and not stay on our plan, amen, or veer off course and get on somebody else's plan even though sometimes God will help us there. I want the perfection of the plans of God, the will of God, don't you? And, and, and it, here's how we get perfection. We get perfection by either hearing that he has said, do this, or getting his stamp of approval on something that we're thinking to do. Once we get that, once we know where he stands on it, and that he's, he's at least not standing against it, we know that we can flow in that perfect will. Thank you, Lord. I want to be in that place. And God has shown, I'm going to give you some more personal testimony here in a minute as we go on. Now, I want you to turn to the book of Luke and get number uh, four here. Only got five. And so in the, in the book of Luke, we, we see Jesus teaching us something by what he did. Remember that Jesus is a man. He's a human. He's walking the earth as a human. And he's showing us how humans ought to function. And as a human, the Bible says in the 6th chapter of Luke 12 verse, it came to pass in those days that he, Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray. You say, well, doesn't he know all the time what's on God's mind? No, he had to pray just like you and I. Why? Because he was a human being, a man in the flesh. Now, on this occasion, he continued all night in prayer to God. Hmm. Why? Because he had a momentous decision to make, and he wanted to ask God specifically about that decision. And what was that decision? It was the calling of his original apostles. When it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12 whom he also named apostles. And then it, it lists their names. Amen? He was praying specifically for God to show him who should I name as an original apostle? He spent a long time getting that direction. Now, a lot of times we get that through a period of uh, prayer times, but many times it takes us that long to really get straight what God is saying on a big decision. Do I have any witnesses here? You, you may not have prayed all night, but you prayed an hour over 10 days, or you prayed two hours over. I mean, many times we have to stay in that until we get comfortable that we've heard from God and we know what he thinks about it. Do I have any witnesses out there? So now, the fourth is just to inquire specifically about your situation for an answer from God. And the uh, testimony I'm going to give is that I was called by a friend of mine, a pastor, who's also on the faculty at Moody Seminary, the, the Detroit uh, campus. And he says to me, uh, the dean position at the, at the uh, seminary is vacant and we need someone to come in and 
take that role at least for a time uh, to buy us some time and he says I think you'd be the perfect person for that now he told me he's not the sole decision maker he's just he's a member of the search committee but he said I immediately thought of you and he told me all the reasons why he thought of me so I said hmm, let me let me pray about this because I knew that would be a big thing to take on my 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 initial inclination was just to say uh-uh uh, don't, you know take my name out of the hat but here's why I didn't do that sometimes God is asking us to do things it's his plan that are not convenient that are not what we had in mind that is not what we would have chosen for ourselves that are not sometimes even what we want to do. But if God, if it's God and it's his plan and he's calling us to it, we need to do what? Say yes. So I wanted to seek the Lord before I answered. So I did that. And it took me a little time. But over a period of a couple of weeks, I heard the Lord say to me, this invitation is not ordained of me as a request of you but if you want to pursue it go ahead now when I heard that I went back to him immediately and said no thanks are y'all listening to me see sometimes uh, our, our first reflex is just a human response and we want to make sure that it's God's response amen that so so we need to at least take a little time and ask him are you with me and then the last one and then I'll give you a few more personal testimonies is this that sometimes you're praying and you don't get clear direction turn to the book of Acts this is what I do in those situations and it's worked well for me I think it'll work well for you Acts chapter 5 Peter and other apostles have been ministering preaching laying hands on people and the Pharisees, the Pharisaic council, they're upset about it. And so that's being talked about in the fifth chapter of Acts. And uh, they're thrown into prison. They're brought before the council. And verse 26 then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, did, did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? See, they had, had been through this before. They had told them, don't, we don't be doing any more preaching in that Jesus name. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to build, to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. I like that, don't you? But that took courage, didn't it? It took courage. He says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you murdered. They're not, they're not uh, pulling any punches here. Now, when they heard what they had to say, verse 33, they were furious and plotted to kill them. This was dangerous for them to stand up like that. But one of the members of the council, a man named Gamaliel, who was a teacher, stood up and challenged them. And he went through an explanation of 
earlier times when they had had people come up and say they were a prophet and they were going to do this and they were going to do that and challenge the authority and so on. And he said it, it, it came to nothing. So this is the advice he gives them, which is going to lead us to our fifth point. Verse 38. Now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to be fighting against God. So here's the, the nugget. The Word of God is like finding gold treasure, isn't it? It's so good, it's so rich, it's so valuable. We need it. I said we need it. So he's saying just let this thing ride because it will eventually reveal itself whether it's of God or whether it's of men. And in our lives, we'll have that same experience. Many times, if we'll just let the thing ride for a little while, it'll become clear. Fuzziness will become clear if we just let it ride for a little while. That's why I think when, whenever you're being, we're being pressured to make a key decision, we should resist that as much as we can. Because we need time to get clear about this God versus man thing and sometimes it'll come very quickly and sometimes it won't so sometimes if someone's pressuring us about a job decision we need to ask for a little time and if they're so in such a hurry that they can't give us a little time just pass on it because here's what happens if it's really something that God intends for you it's going to come back. They can say, well, we can't wait. We're going to offer it to the next person. If that is something that God has really intended, they can offer it to the next person and the person after that. Eventually, it's going to come back to you. If it is from God. You all following me? So we don't need to be uh, hurried or pressured into doing things. I have used this so many times. I'll, I'll share a couple of examples. I had a call. Sometimes when you, at least this is the way I function. If I get a call very unexpected from someone, uh, many times that is something that God is doing because it's like, where did this come from? And he operates like that. He just... Things happen that you never expected. And all of a sudden, some opportunity has opened up. And so I get a call from this lady, and she says to me, you may not remember me, but her name is Kathy Sweeney, but I remember you from 20 years ago. She said, I was working at Josie Bass, which is a publisher, business books. She said, I worked on your last book from when you were at the University of Michigan. I was one of the editors that worked on that book. And she said, I remembered you from that. Now she's had my number 20 years have passed. She calls me and she says, I'm now working for another publisher and I'm interested in knowing, are, are you uh, interested in writing an, another book? Do you have something that we could talk to you about? So she's working for a publisher based in London, but her office is in San Francisco. So I say to her, let me think about it for a little while. So I did that. I prayed, and I got a lead. I didn't get an answer, but a leading to just let it play out. And so I did that, and, when, and, and here, one of the reasons that I didn't, that I thought this might have been from God is because I had a, a friend who was asking me to write a book with him about the inequity in the economic system in the United States. The kind of stuff we were talking about in that Wednesday night class. Because he is a finance guy, owns a financial advising company, and he's one of the people that has impressed upon me this problem with the tax law. Remember we had that discussion. So 
in the 90s, if you worked for a living, wages, a salary, your tax rate was lower than someone who got their money through just investing. So let's say some rich guy who inherited a few million dollars, he's got dividends and capital gains, he's big in the stock market, his tax rate was higher. That's flipped since the 90s. Now, if you're earning wages, your tax rate is significantly higher than the same income being earned through investments. What does that do? It shifts the tax burden to the little person and away from the rich people. That's what it does. So this guy is up in arms about that. I don't blame him. I am too. But he wants to write a book about it. So I knew that. So when she called me, I thought, hmm, this is God maybe making a way for that book to happen sooner rather than later. But at the same time, I thought, hmm, am I ready to write a, write a book right now? I'm not sure I'm ready to take that on right now. So I'm kind of in a quandary. So I call her back to continue the dialogue, and they tell me she's no longer with the company. So then I get my answer, you see. Waiting to see. Now, I'll give you another example. This is a different example. I had a, a, I had one of the guys in our group, the Alliance for Racial Harmony, is a partner at Deloitte. It's a big con uh, consulting firm. Some of you are familiar with it. He's the only African-American partner in Detroit. He calls me, and he's on the board at Olivet College, which is a Christian college here in Michigan. He says they're looking to do some work with our book and some other things relating to diversity and equity. And he, he says, I want you to work with me. So I say, fine. But he's on the board. He's doing this uh, as a board member. But I said, uh, well, we get into a talk with the president, no problem. But then they're asking for workshops to be designed and delivered. So I said to my friend, uh, when I get into doing workshops, I've got to be paid. He was trying to get me to do one or two workshops for free as kind of a teaser, you know. So I didn't tell him this and this, these words, but I'm way past that. I'm not doing any teasers. If, if they want me to come and do, I, and I did, I did tell him this. I said, I have never even been asked to do a workshop without being paid. So I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Now, I knew all the time, this is a Christian organization. He's a Christian. I knew all the time there was a good chance that this was a God thing. But I tested it by because I wasn't getting a direct answer from God. So I, I'm going to let this play out. But in the meantime, I want to let them know that there are some conditions here. Just normal stuff, right? And I am thinking, this, this was my position, if it doesn't happen, I'm okay with that. Amen? Because I am not getting any message from God saying, do this. So now I feel free to do it or not do it. So I, put, I just let that ride for weeks. And in the end, I finally get a chance to talk directly to the client. We get a contract drawn up. And we did our first workshop on Friday. Paid. <laughs> Amen. So now I see this is of God. We're going to do it. I'm excited about it. But see, I had to let that ride a little while to really see. So I think this Gamaliel approach is really good. Now I just want to share with you a few more thoughts and then we'll close I told you I think last time in part one that there are three possible 
responses of God to things that we're thinking of doing. One is his, his command that he's ordained this to be done. And I gave you, I think, a couple of examples from my life. Of course, one of them was the founding of LTW. That was something that God asked me to do. It was very clear because I had no intention of doing anything like that. And it was not convenient. It was not convenient. But it was a, an order from God. It was a request from God. Now, I could have said no, or I could have just ignored it and, and, and convinced myself that that wasn't God. Because when we don't want to do something, we sometimes want to frame it like that. Amen? But, but, but I, I knew it was from God. He made it very clear. I've never had God speak to me more clearly than he did for that. It was prescribed. When, when uh, we left the South and came back to Michigan, I told my wife, I've told this before, we wanted to stay in the South. I wanted to stay in the South. She wanted to stay in the South at that time. We liked it down there. But I had a, and, and we were, I had an offer to stay there, two offers, good offers, one from Nor University of North Carolina and one from Hampton. I had an offer to be dean at Hampton, an offer to be professor at North Carolina, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. We had two options. We liked both options. We had gone to Norfolk, to Hampton. We liked it there. We were already in, the, in the North Carolina. We liked it there. We had been there eight years. But, but what happened was God started gnawing on the inside of me, go back to Michigan, go back to Michigan. And Cynthia had even gotten to the point where as much as she loved Michigan and her family, she had gotten to the point where she was saying, let's stay in the South. And then I ended up having to go back and convince her to come back to Michigan because I, I knew God is asking for this now. Amen? See, we get it through him speaking or we get it through the Holy Spirit, that, that message on the inside that, that you get that, you know, it's not, not even words, it's just a, a recognition Here's what God is saying. Here's what God is asking for. When we left, moved the church from Detroit, out of Detroit, that was a God direction to do that. I told the leaders. I heard from God. I laid on the altar there for hours praying, and God spoke to me. He said, come out to a place that I will show you. So when you hear like that, our posture is what? Yes, Lord. Amen? The second category is a permissive will of God. So I, most of you know I wrote three books while I was at the University of Michigan. The first one was God Ordained. I think I talked about that before. The second two were permissive will, not God Ordained but God permitted. So that was permissive will, meaning uh, God's okay with it. He's not asking for it. Amen? Um, I, uh, I have uh, another, and you can pray about this, request. Pray this week because I have a meeting on the 26th. Is that Wednesday or Thursday? pray about this uh, I got a call a week ago from this same guy who asked me to uh, apply to be dean at Moody and he says to me that Moody has a theological seminary has a grant to do a research project on urban churches and he he says I think you'd be the perfect person to lead this. 
And, and so I, when I called him back, I said, I'm going to pray about this. But I said, but I asked him, I said, is this a uh, throw your, your uh, hat in the ring kind of thing? He said, no. He said, this is a done deal. So on Thursday, members of the board, and, and he, I guess, is on the board, uh, were meeting over in Warren, and I told him I got to get some more information, but this could be coming. It could be a big deal. And so I want you to pray about that. But this is something, again, that I believe is in the permissive will. I've been praying. I think it's a permissive will thing. I don't think God has ordained this. He might still. But uh, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that he has given a green light on it. And if they talk right, I'm, I feel like I'm going to need to do this. So pray for it because uh, it could really help the seminary prepare uh, ministers more effectively. That's the goal. And uh, uh, I'm excited about the possibility of making a contribution. So that's another example, permissive will. The third is the red light. And I think I gave you an example of the red light last time. I'll give you another example of the red light. While I was doing consulting, I'm still doing consulting at a company in Warren, and the, the owner is a wonderful Christian guy, and uh, they had a big problem with their human resources function, and I was doing, looking into that. And the leadership team came to me one day and said, would you be willing to take this job as the human resource director, at least temporarily? I immediately got a red light on that. So I didn't even pray. I just told them <laughs> right on the spot, I can't do that. I can't do that. So sometimes we get the red light, amen? And when we get the red light, we have to know not to run through the red light. Amen? We can do it now. Amen. I ran through a red light once. I'm still paying for it, <laughs> literally paying for it. <laughs> Amen. So let me leave you with this, 1 John chapter 5, because sometimes we get a little nervous, uptight about distinguishing the plan of God from our own thinking. And... Uh, I don't think we need to get uptight about it. Here's why. And I mentioned this before. We have a, a wonderful promise in the Word. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything that is according to His will, we know that He hears us. And knowing that He hears us, we know doesn't say we, we think, we might, we know that we receive the petitions that we're asking of him. Now, how many of you believe that God wants us to know his will? That he wants us to know his plan? So if we're asking to know the will of God, how many know he's already promised us in his word? He will hear and answer that prayer. Is that true? If we ask anything according to his will, we know it's his will that he wants us to be directed by him. We don't need scripture for that, do we? We could get some, but we don't need it. So we have confidence that he is going to answer our prayer to distinguish, to have revelation of the knowledge of his will, to know more the will of God, to know what he's saying about this particular situation. As long as we're asking, see, the, God's, the key to God is he wants us to ask him 
Because if we don't, we're signaling that we're not, we're not posturing ourselves to be driven by God's direction. Two things he wants us to ask, and he wants us to be genuinely willing to hear his answer. Not just what we want, but what he's saying. Are you listening to me? When they called those 400 prophets, they wanted to hear, oh yeah, go up, take them, the battle is yours. They brought in a real prophet who said, that is not the situation here. Don't do it. They ignored him. Why? Because he didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. We have to, and God will know if we're postured that way. Won't he? He'll know. If we're really willing to submit to that will, he'll know. And he will direct us. Do you believe me? Everybody say, thank you, Lord. Confident, taking back the land he's promised, we will not forget.